Hello and welcome everybody. This is the MATLAB in Simulink Racing Lounge. Well, for today's episode, let me just mention two keywords. Micro out of box and Frank. Hello, Frank. Hello, Christoph. So glad to have you here. Frank Schmidtmeier representing DSpace. Um, we will um, introduce you in a minute about what that episode is. And first of all, Frank, could you introduce yourself uh, briefly? Yes, I can. Um, I'm Frank Schmidtmeier. I work at DSpace and I'm an application engineer at DSpace. And I'm also a trainer for the DSpace products control desk. And I also give the training DSpace real-time systems. Great, thanks a lot. Well, first of all, and well, we have to do that, we will tell you why we are doing that episode. Um, it will have to do with DSpace, with micro out of box, with ECUs, control systems, um, but more of that in a minute. Um, we will introduce you to a very nice uh, demo that uh, from the student team has provided us with, uh, Strom and Söhne from TH Nuremberg. And then the main part of that episode will be a combined hardware and software demo, including the micro out of box. We will talk about CAN monitoring and data recording. And as you are used to, um, last but not least, we have the key takeaways and a very powerful resources slide. So we will point you to a lot of stuff um, that will be helpful for your car development. Um, Frank, I think first of all, we really have to explain uh, the background of that episode a bit, why we are doing it. Uh, a lot of teams are using the DSpace Micro out of box as uh, prototyping hardware or as uh, ECU in, in their vehicles. Mm -hmm. And yeah, they use it typically um, with a CAN controller um, to access data, to get some data from sensors mm -hmm. or to control actuators while CAN or while the CAN open. Great. Control. And well, this is basically the reason why I've approached DSpace um, because you have pretty cool hardware. You, you, well, you provide software tools to, to interface to the ECUs. Well, a lot of teams use Simulink for control design. And in that episode today, uh, we want to show you how these two, two worlds um, join together. And we do that, as already said, in a combined hardware and software demo. Before jumping to that, um, let's have actually a look to a model that a former student team has provided us with. Um, great acknowledgement to uh, Strom und Söhne from TH Nuremberg. Um, before seeing their model, um, well, let's get an overview of what they have done. They have the micro out of box as a main ECU. And I think all the all the further details, Frank, you can explain a bit better because you've talked to the guys. So what, what are they doing? Um, some of the members of the uh, student, from your student team, uh, Strom and Söhne, gave me some information about their model. Um, they use the micro auto box as their central ECU in their vehicle. And they have several sensors. And all these sensors are uh, connected to the micro auto box via the CAN automotive bus. Mm -hmm. um, with a special ship, uh, the sensor information are sent to the CAN controller mm -hmm. and processed in the micro auto box. And from the micro auto box, they use a CAN and a CAN open uh, communication to control uh, their actuators, like an inverter and a battery management system. Okay, so pretty important parts of, of the of the vehicle. Yeah, they, for example, um, as mentioned on the slide, they have wheel speed sensors, brake pressure, accelerator position, so important information to, to run the car. Correct. And as a feature, they also use the USB flight recorder to log the data during um, test phases or during the race. Perfect. So that's the model that Strom and Söhne has provided us with. Frank, can you, uh, well, um, tell us a bit about the blocks used there, about the general concept there. Yeah, you can hear, uh, you can see here on the model route um, that there are several um, DSpace RTI blocks are used for the CAM controller. For yeah. example, here's the RTI CAN-MM um, general setup block, as well as controller setup blocks. And in the model are the configuration blocks to control um, the CAM controllers or to configure the CAM controllers. Mm -hmm. We also see here a USB flight recorder setup block, um, which is used um, to set up the USB flight recorder available on the micro auto box to log the data. And um, we can have a look uh, inside the subsystem, which is here the sensor, smart sensor subsystem. Here is the CAM communication implemented. I will double click on the system. Mm -hmm. And you can see here several signals which are coming from the bus and which are uh, which are set um, to the CAN bus. And the configuration is done via this RTI CAN multi-message main setup block. Mm -hmm. uh, this block here yeah, configures the complete CAN communication of receiving and sending data 
with a can controller. Perfect. So can we, um, well, w what is that team actually doing? So I read a uh, link rod, which is steering wheel, brake light. Um, so what actually are they controlling and what is actually running on the, on the micro out of box? Yeah, um, they are reading this data from mm -hmm. uh, from the can, okay. and uh, they have implemented their complete control um, control design in Simulink. Uh, and um, yeah, out of this data, they read the information, process the data, and then they control the uh, inverter as well as the better management system. Um, they get the steam wheel angle and wheel speed signals and yeah, brake pressure sensors, and all these data are used yeah for the control control design. That's pretty impressive. So, um, and I think this is the point where we can, well, where we have to, to get one step back and say, okay, we don't want to start with a very complex model here. Um, let's try to do something simple, um, but having in mind that, that really complex vehicle dynamic controllers running on a micro auto box are possible. Actually, former student teams are already doing it. And I think now let's switch to teaching mode. Uh, what we want to do is we want to, well, help you setting these things up, help you getting a, a basic understanding. And I think this is the point where, well, where we go with a much simpler model. Um, uh, with that model, we wanted to show what is possible at the end. Yes. Um, and during the demonstration, we use a much simpler model, a simpler model for just, we want to introduce the basic steps, how to implement uh, reading uh, messages from the CAN and reading the signals from the CAN. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, here's the hardware setup of our simple demo uh, example. We have a micro auto box as uh, the central processing unit mm -hmm. and a CAN sensor. In this case, it only measures uh, temperature. But you can imagine that you can connect much more sensors to the CAN bus and you can use a uh, complex control design on the micro auto box. Mm -hmm. One special thing is here that we use a power supply for the micro auto box with mm -hmm. a, a non-standard connector. So we have, in this case, we have used the remote input mm -hmm. pin of the um, micro auto box, which uh, is quite useful to ensure the data consistency of the USB flight recorder, because in this case, it closes the file which is recorded on the micro auto box properly. Here you can see a graphic from the documentation where the connection seam is demonstrated, how to wire the micro auto box. You can see that here, the remote pin, um, that's the pin number four of the connector of the micro auto box is used to, um, to use this as a remote or so-called terminal 15 or Klemme 15 to switch off the micro auto box. Mm -hmm. And with this approach, um, we can ensure that the files on the USB flight recorder are closed properly and that they can later be read um, in MATLAB or in control disk. Um, well, this was already pretty hands-on help, so thanks a lot. Now we can move on to the software part of the demonstration. We'll set up the model that we then will deploy onto the micro auto board. Okay, here you can see a very simple model um, in Simulink. It's an offline model where we have um, typical Simulink blocks to um, simulate this application offline. You can see here as data source, a constant block and a random uh, noise generator to imitate the noise which is maybe available on a real sensor. And then we decided just to use a very simple FIR filter to smooth the data mm -hmm. and to put these data on an oscilloscope. And um, we have also a small um, implementation of a temperature over over temperature detection. Here's a value of a threshold of maybe 26 degrees, mm -hmm. and it's compared to the uh, filtered signal, and we will see it on a display. This can later be used in control disk to indicate that, for example, a temperature is over a certain threshold. Mm -hmm. Perfect. This is a very nice example of a, of a Simulink uh, model. Um, what we, well, we kept it really easy on purpose, um, but what you can see behind is, well, filtering is just one of the opportunities you have in Simulink. Um, you can go a lot more complex, as we've seen for the Strom und Söhne. Um, and again, you can also introduce some, some logic. So in that case, it's, it's very simple. So as soon as the temperature value exceeds a certain threshold, um, you can get a signal out and that signal could say, oh my God, I have to switch on the cooling system. Um, so you can implement controllers, you can implement a lot of simulink functionality, you can implement logic decisions. Um, but I think, Frank, that's a perfect model. Just keep it simple. Um, we have shown what is possible and, and guys will be able to relate that to more complex uh, topics. 
Yeah. And later we can um, replace the uh, constant blocks and the random number by real sensor input. Mm -hmm. And in our application, this is done by the CAM controller, which we have to implement. Okay. Well, and before doing that, let's just run the model to see that it's actually working and then start to gradually build up um, with the interface to the micro outer box. Okay. We can run the online, offline simulation. Here, I have a simulation time of two seconds. We have to change that later for the real-time application. I start. Okay, it's ready. Here is the result of the simulation. You can see the yellow signal, which is a bit noisy, and the purple signal, which is smooth. So we have a proper effect of the filtering and a much smoother signal than uh, the original one. A typical approach for smoothing sensor signals, which are a bit noisy. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, oh. This is just one, again, one of the opportunities you have in Simulink. And I think now, Frank, we can well, start to make it ready um, to be deployed onto the micro outer box. The first thing we have to do is we have this set to inf. Then we have to open the real-time interface library. Um, therefore, you can just type RTI1401 in the MATLAB command line or just um, open it from the library. So this is the DSpace real-time interface block library for the DSpace micro outer box. DSpace micro outer micro outer box has the number DS1401 and indicates the base model of several different variants of the micro outer box. Mm -hmm. This block set is included in the Simulink, Simulink library, and here we have special blocks to access the I/O. And because CAN is a bit more complex, we have a block set which is used to configure the CAN communication on the micro outer box. Therefore, I will click on the block set and open, and this time, the, in this case, the RTI CANNM block set. Just, Frank, uh, a question that, that comes to my mind here. Um, we, we are talking about CAN, which is somehow a protocol, a communication protocol. Um, why do formula student teams use it a lot? Why is it used in automotive industry a lot? Or where is it not used? So can can we get a short overview about that? Just yeah. Briefly? Um, yeah. Due to my experience, uh, typically in the automotive industry, the CAN bus is used for communication between different ECUs or mm -hmm. special lens, uh, special sensors, for example, the um, uh, steering wheel sensor. Mm -hmm. And for former students, it's quite common that they use uh, the CAN or CAN open protocol mm -hmm. to control inverters, maybe the battery management systems. Okay. And also, um, there are several sensors available which are used um, to connect uh, or which are used to connect via CAN, via the CAN uh, okay. bus to the micro outer box. Okay, that then well, well, can makes perfect sense for me. And well, we, we just can go ahead and, and set it up with the CAN communication capabilities. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, this RTI CAN multi-message block set. Um, yeah, that's, these are the main blocks we will use in our application. And first of all, I have to use the general setup block. This is always necessary. You have to create one general setup block and this setup block defines where um, the generated files for the CAN communication are stored. For example, here you can see um, there's a special folder generated where all these files are included. Mm -hmm. You can leave the default settings as they are. As a next step, I choose the controller setup block. And um, to say it uh, in a simple way, the control, uh, CAN controller setup block describes the hardware and the general settings on the physical layer of the CAN protocol. For example, you can describe in this or does it define in this CAN controller setup block um, things like which of the CAN controllers you want to use. For example, on the micro auto box, there are more than uh, there's more than one CAN controller available. In this case, I have one CAN controller, controller one, um, on the board, and I use also here indicated the number one and I specify the baud rate to 500 kilobits. This is, by the way, also the default setting. Mm -hmm. And I also use a termination resistor um, in the micro outer box. So because um, in this case, the micro outer box is at one end of the line of the CAN bus. 
Okay, perfect. So what I see here, we pretty much use the default settings. So are there any settings that teams really should care about um, where they should not use the default setting or be just in general be curious about? Yeah, a typical parameter which you might change is the baud rate. Maybe mm -hmm. your sensors have a different baud rate mm -hmm. or um, uh, you have to look what uh, which cam controller on the micro auto box you really use because this is important for the wiring. Okay. Um, the pins are on different uh, on the yeah on the connector on different pins the communication. Mm -hmm. and therefore, the setting is very important. Okay, thanks. I will close that and automatically um, an S function is generated with some blocks here at the beginning to indicate that we have only one variant and a reset button. The next step we have to do is to uh, use uh, the main controller block and here more or less the configuration um, of the communication protocol is done. I choose this main block and drag and drop it to the model and here a lot more configuration. Okay, uh, Frank, just, just a recap, we, we use three blocks here that are called RTI CAN multi-message. But what I got from you, well, general setup is required for every model. And with a controller setup block, we specify all the, well, the hardware connectivity. And with a main block, um, well, we, we do the software part, right? Is it a, about a right high level overview? Yeah, that's, about, that's more or less correct. Um, the controller just specifies the lower level of the communication. The mm -hmm. main block uh, specifies the higher protocol levels of the communication, so you can say it's more or less the thing we do in software. For an easy approach, I will click on this main block and a dialog window open. In this dialog window, you can specify a lot of settings. In our very simple application, we just want to read some messages or signals from the CAN. So the first thing what we have to do is we have to connect this main block to our controller setup block. This is done by the name. You can see here controller one is specified. So that was a controller name given in this controller setup block. As a next thing, and this is a typical approach most of the people working with CAN do, is they use a DBC file which specifies the communication um, on the CAN bus. And for our sensor, we have also a CAN file which we will now import under the database section. Yeah, for the frequent viewers of the Racing Lounge, um, we already have used this DBC blocks um, in our episode about Vehicle Networks Toolbox, which is also nothing but a software tool to interface with CAN networks. And as far as I remember, um, well, DBC, every, every sensor has a DBC block with some basic configurations. So is it also, well, the sensor configuration here in that case, Frank? I think typically the DBC file describes the complete communication on a on a CAN bus, mm -hmm. um, but I think for a convenient approach, a lot of suppliers for sensors have a DBC file, mm -hmm. which they give with a sensor, or you have to write your own or just copy and paste the different parts mm -hmm. into one file and adapt this. Okay. And then you have the complete communication of your CAN bus. Mm -hmm. In our case, we have a DBC file provided by the supplier of the sensor. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this makes it much easier to configure uh, the complete settings in RTI CAN-MM. We just want to read some messages. And by the way, the CAN is built, uh, or the typical protocol includes messages, and messages include signals. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I can here under messages, I can choose a message. And we have TX and RX messages. And we just want to receive, so we choose okay. uses RX. And here are all the messages listed which are available in the DBC file. The default setting is all, so I will read all messages. That's mm -hmm. okay for our uh, use case. And as a next step, we have to define which signals included in these messages we want to see. Okay, in that case, T for transmit and R for receive, right? Yes, that's okay. correct. Mm -hmm. So I go to signals and under signals, I can see here that I have also some RX signals, mm -hmm. and here are all signals specified in the DBC files are listed. Okay. And I can select all signals or just yeah some selected signals. Mm -hmm. For our application, it is okay if you select all signals, even if mm -hmm. only the channel one signal includes the temperature signal. Okay, this just says, well, we could plug some more sensors into that system if, if required. Yeah, for the performance, it makes no difference. Mm -hmm. And um, therefore, we can just select all signals and easily connect later on different other mm -hmm. sensors. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay. So now I will create the application and the configuration. An S function is automatically created. Okay. Now I've closed um, the configuration dialog window. And you can see here on the main block, there is a port RX data. So out of this port, um, we will get all the signals which we just selected in the main block. Mm -hmm. And we will now replace the simulink blocks, the constant and the random number, by this main block and transfer the data to the filter. Mm -hmm. And also for the real-time application, the scope is not necessary anymore, and I will delete these lines and later replace it by a flight recorder. Because we have selected several signals, and they are available as a simulink bus, and we just want to choose the first signal, the channel 1 signal, which includes our temperature. Therefore, we select simulink bus selector block and connect it to our RTI block and configure on this bus creator block which signals we want to have. Here, we can remove the default signals and just select channel 1 as a signal and say apply, OK. And now this signal is available and we can connect it to our discrete filter. Mm -hmm. So with this application, or with this parts, with these blocks, we are able to read in uh, sensor data from, from a CAN bus. In our case, only the temperature. Mm -hmm. As a next step, we can use, for example, the USB flight recorder to record the data. And the USB flight recorder automatically starts if you start your application later on the micro out box. Mm -hmm. To implement the flight recorder, I have, again, to go to the RTI library and to the special uh, micro out -the box or the variant which I use. So here you can see just the real-time interface for the micro out -the box. And in my uh, case, I use the DS1511 variant of the micro out -the box. And I can just click on this and open a special I.O. library, which is only available for this micro out -the box. But you have also the approach to the baseboard. And the baseboard is more or less the same on all micro auto boxes. And you can see here that we have a flight recorder available. Double click on the system. We get the RTI blocks to set up and read or write, in this case, sorry, write the data from the micro auto box. Mm -hmm. We start with the USB flight recorder setup block. I just drag and drop this block to the model and choose also the write block and change to the model. Just set the setup block here and mm -hmm the write block to the flight recorder here. We start with the setup block. In the setup block, you can just specify uh, the overwrite mode. Um, you have the choice between discard data or replace old data. We choose old data. So this means if the USB stick is full, old data will be replaced. Mm -hmm. Apply. OK. And the write block is for connecting a simulink signal to this recorder. You can click on this block. And we can see here there is just a name. In our case, we are recording the temperature, so I change the variable name to temp. And you can see that here a data type is specified. And the data type here is single, or you have the choice between different other integer formats. Mm -hmm. You don't have the choice to record a double data. Okay. We choose, in this case, the single data type. Mm -hmm. that, that means why are we not uh, able to, to take a uint8 or uint16 uh, data type? Okay. Simulink uses, in this case, a typical a double variable, mm -hmm. so floating, floating point variable. And um, it is not necessary to use here an integer data type, because also um, without conversion, you have a loss of the QFC. Because Simulink uses double data type for the normal signals, we have to add a data type conversion block here, which we choose out of the Simulink library. And add it here, double click on the block, and configure the output data type to Single, single. Mm -hmm. apply, OK, just connect this block and connect the signal line. And we are ready with our simple application. Perfect. So um, I think we have plugged in a lot of blocks. So what are the next required steps? Well, to, to generate code from that. I, I expect some solver settings are required. Yes, we have to check that. Um, with a normal installation of the RTI block, the normal default settings are automatically done, mm -hmm. but we will have a look at that. Great. Therefore, we have a look at the settings of the model in simulation, model configuration parameters. We have here this dialog window with the settings of the model. Mm -hmm. A first important setting is the SOVA options. 
Here it is important that you define the stop time to infinite. And also very important is that the server option is set to fixed step. Mm -hmm. And in this case, we use a discrete server because in our model, we have no differential equations included. It's just a discrete model without the necessity to use a differential equation. Okay. As a fixed step size, we use in, in our application one millisecond. This is typical for automotive applications. Perfect. On, on the hardware side, are there any restrictions from the micro auto box or could I use also different um, fixed step size uh, or different sample time? You can use different sample times. Typical, there's no definite limit, but depending on the size of your model, 50 microseconds or higher is, uh, an, uh, is a normal um, sample time for the micro auto box. Okay, but what you have told me in the preparation of that episode, so one millisecond is pretty common in, in automotive industry, so there's no reason yeah, to, to go for anything else here, right? A lot of uh, people in the automotive in industry use one millisecond. Maybe they use some uh, subsystems which run faster, mm -hmm. but the main model or the main part okay. is typically run in one millisecond. Mm -hmm. Okay. As a next step, we have to go to the code generation and to check for which target this model um, is built. And here it is very important to see that the system target file is set to RTI 1401. This is the number of the micro auto box. And TLC stands for target language compiler. So we have here the correct compiler for our target, the micro auto box. Mm -hmm. um, we, we've already had an episode on, on code generation. We, we went already to the, the, through the TLC process. Um, what would you mention, Frank? Um, if, if the model is set up correctly, these settings should be also made by default, right? Yeah, typically if you have the DSpace installation and um, you start with the model, this is normally set to this value which mm -hmm. is recommended for the micro auto box. Okay, perfect. Okay, then we can close this dialog window. Everything is for our model is correct. We can check with Control D if everything else is able to update. You can also use Simulink update diagram and here looks pretty good yeah looks good no problems and then we can generate the code mm -hmm. and this is done via code c code build model or just press ctrl d and in this case due to the target language compiler sdf files this is a special dspace format a system description file and some other files are automatically generated and later in control disk, we use this SDF file and automatically the other necessary files like the executable, which is later downloaded to the micro auto box, are automatically generated and imported later in control disk. Okay, well, uh, I have a comment and a question here. First, a comment, you have the build button also directly on the Simulink canvas. So just um, the very right button here. And the question that I have is, um, you said it's an SDF file generated. It's also the code generated. Um, the code is probably put to the micro auto box, but where is this SDF file put? Um, the SDF file is just used uh, to describe the, the files uh, which are needed. The SDF file is typically imported in control disk. Okay. And to this file belong also a so-called trace file, which includes the symbolic variables. So the variable names, which you know from Simulink mm -hmm. and the map file, where you find the physical structure of the memory, where these uh, symbolic numbers or where the link between the symbolic variables and uh, the physical memory yeah, is described. And these files are necessary to access later the variables on the micro auto box with control disk. Okay, well, this would have been my next question. Why do we need that file? Because we will well, assemble that system in control disk later on. Okay. Yeah. So the build process is completed. We can leave Simulink and change to Control Disk to download the application to the micro auto box and look at the CAN communication and other things which are available in Control Disk. Okay, perfect. Okay, this is Control Disk. This is a graphical user interface of Control Disk. This is a DSpace main tool to access and interact with our platform as well as other devices which can be connected to Control Disk. We start with creating a project. This is necessary, and in the project, we are working with an experiment. In the project manager, we can right-click and choose new project and experiment. And then this dialog window comes up, and we have to enter the name of the project and specify a root directory. 
For example, I have chosen, I have entered already the root directory for our application for the formula student and change here formula student. Mm -hmm. Enter next. I have to enter the name of the experiment temp sensor and just press next so that you can see here there's a selection of different platforms. Platforms are DSpace hardware. Mm -hmm. For example, here's the micro auto box connected. I choose this micro auto box, press next, and then I have chosen the hardware and now I have to yeah, select or import the variable description file. And for DSpace hardware, we have here um, the SDF file which, which describes this hardware. So now here I will import the file. This is available um, where the model is stored. Mm -hmm. Here's this temperature sensor file. I will open this SDF file and automatically all the other files which are necessary are imported to control disk. Mm -hmm. I just can press finish and the project and the experiment is automatically generated on the site. And enlarge this a bit. Here's our experiment mm -hmm. with the hardware and the SDF file. Okay, Frank, just a question at that point. So I'm, I, I roughly know what is going to happen, um, but what is a typical use case for control desk? Um, well, you have access to signals, you well, can visualize stuff. Um, so what would the teams do? Before, before we explain it, just let's get a high level overview of what, what we do there. Yeah, control desk um, is a tool to interact um, with a DSpace platform. Mm -hmm. So you are able to measure data, to just to, to display data, mm -hmm. and also, I think that is important, to change parameters on the real-time hardware during the runtime. So maybe okay. in our application, we can later change the threshold of this over-temperature value or access other parameters which are available in the Simulink model. Mm -hmm. Well, just to sum it all up to, to one phrase, it's, it's a direct connection to your hardware, and you can interact with your models, visualize data, and so on. Yeah, that's true. We can mm -hmm. interact with this platform. Okay, before we um, start with the layouting, so meaning that we put some instruments on a layout and display the data, we have one feature. It's called the bus navigator. And this is a special part to, um, yeah, to get some data from the CAN controller, mm -hmm. um, which is connected to the micro auto box here or the CAN. And I want to start with adding a simple monitor on this CAN controller. I just can add here an unfiltered monitor to, yeah, to have a look at the CAN communication. I just press here, OK. Mm -hmm. And you can see at the moment, I could not start the monitoring. This is because I'm not connected to the micro auto box and I haven't downloaded the application. Mm -hmm. And this can be done via this home ribbon. And here is the symbol go online. This means I will be connected, or control disk is connecting with the micro auto box and automatically the application is downloaded to the micro auto box yeah. and you can see here it's downloading in this case we will get a warning message this is related to the usb flight recorder and it just says that there is a usb flight recorder um, available okay and here in the platform manager we can see that the micro auto box is available and connected mm -hmm. and the symbol indicates that uh, an application is running and i'm in the online mode and mm -hmm. now I'm able to start here this CAN monitoring. And you can see there is several communication on the CAN bus. I also can change the continuous view to a static view. This is mm -hmm. more convenient for eyes. And for example, here is the first message. And here is in channel one is mm -hmm. um, the temperature uh, which we measure at the moment. OK, there's no big surprise here. So we're getting a temperature signal. And yeah. we are not using the other channels. And for a more convenient or a more proper display, we can use the layout mm -hmm. and include some instruments, for example, for measuring the data. Therefore, we have here on this uh, uh, right side, we have an uh, instrument selector where are different instruments available. And I have prepared some nice instruments for our application. So I will start with a bar. And here you can see there is a bar. And you can, for example, directly drag and drop a signal from the bus navigator, for example, this temperature signal on this instrument. Or another possibility is to go to the variables browser and open this here, go to the models root branch, and you can find here several variables or branches which are uh, well known from the simulate model. For example, the over temperature signal or the discrete filter. 
and there's an output which we can use. I will put this, for example, on the display. Mm -hmm. And now I'm, I'm starting to understand what you meant by connection to both hardware and software, um, because we have all the all the signals that are in Simulink, we can access them from here. Yeah. Also, as we said, we have also a parameter. For example, here's a threshold, mm -hmm. so that we just uh, that we cannot only read the data. Uh, sorry, I will first choose here uh, a numeric input mm -hmm. with proper instrument for uh, writing data, so we can read and write the data mm -hmm. and other instruments, for example, instrument which is indicating that we have um, an over temperature mm -hmm. available here. And at the moment, you could see the threshold is at 26 degrees and mm -hmm. the actual temperature is around about 33. So you can see here that if I um, increase the normal temperature and it's over the threshold, uh, the instrument changes its, its, its color. Well, and this, uh, again, for me, a pretty nice way to see that, well, it's a vice versa communication, because for your control system, that could mean, okay, temperature is getting too high, you have to switch on a, a cooling system. And here we, we also can see that you have access to that to that information. Yeah. Uh, additionally, we have also a plotter, which yeah shows um, if you want to measure data. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I choose a plotter here. I make it a bit smaller so that it fits on, on the layout. And I will choose also the signal from the FIR filter, the measurement signal, and just plot it on, put it on the axis. And yeah, at this moment, you cannot see something because we haven't started the measurement. And this can be done via this ribbon. And you can start here with the measuring. Mm -hmm. The difference between if you're in the online mode and if in the measurement mode is that in the um, online mode, just the data are, yeah, are pulled temporarily. And with the measurement mode, you will really get exactly the data. In this case, every millisecond, you will get new data. Mm -hmm. At the moment, the plotter, plotter does not look very good because we haven't changed to the continuous measurement mode. This is better for um, yeah, recording or uh, measuring a continuous signal. Mm -hmm. In this case, we have to change to the measurement configuration and click on the platform here and open this host service or raster and change here the measurement configuration to measure continuously. So in this case, we get a mm -hmm. continuous temperature signal on the plotter. And if I increase the temperature here, you can see also you can follow the line and mm -hmm. utilize this signal on the plotter. By the way, also the signal is available or recorded from the start of this application on the USB flight recorder, which we have set up in the simulating model. And these, all these data which we have um, yeah, connected to the flight recorder are uh, recorded to this. We can also have a look at that. Therefore, I will stop um, the communication. And mm -hmm. in a typical application for the Florida student teams, I think you are on a test drive. And if you return, you typically switch off your uh, car. So either you turn off the terminal 15 or switch off the remote input of the micro auto box. And I will do that too. Mm -hmm. And once again, this ensures that the data are closed properly. Mm -hmm. If you switch off the micro auto box, so control desk lost the communication, and therefore you also get a warning message. Mm -hmm. I will Basically, warning. just to help guys watching the video, what you have done is you have removed the uh, well, power for the micro auto box, switch it off. The remote input, not the power. The power is on. Mm -hmm. uh, as in a real car, the battery is always connected, but yeah. I just switch off the remote input. Okay, perfect. And you have taking the USB stick that we now can, well, take the data from. Yes. As you can see, I have connected the USB stick. Mm -hmm. And here are the data which are available on this USB stick. This is our file, which is recorded. You can see it's a binary file. And we have to, or we can use control disk mm -hmm. to convert this file in a proper file and later export it to MATLAB. One simple trick. As a file, I use control disk. And here I use this folder available in the experience, measurement data, right mouse button, explore folder. This opens this, this folder. And I can open the flight recorder as well and just drag and drop this signal to this measurement data part. Mm -hmm. I have to import this file to the database of control risk. Therefore, I just click here on the measurement data pool and say import. And here are several files available. I'm on the wrong folder. I have to change to control disk. And 
to this measurement data file. I will open this file and it's transferred in a so-called IDF file, which can be used directly in control disk. We can check for the data or just export this file to a MAT format mm -hmm. so that you can later use it for further processing in MATLAB. Okay, perfect. So I'm seeing a MAT file here and well, this is for me the connection to, to MATLAB. In, in a previous episode of the Racing Lounge, we have shown you, well, um, how to do data acquisition, data processing. Um, at the end of that um, video, I've provided you with some resources. So there's no need for us to open MATLAB right now and do data processing. Um, just um, have a look at, at episodes that cover that topic more in detail. Just another question, Frank. I'm returning from a test drive with a USB stick. Can I automate the process of, of, of creating a MAT file? Yeah, I think you can write a file and use uh, an executable file which automatically transfers your um, IDF file or your bin binary file to a MAT file. That's possible, I think. Perfect. Great. Personally, I really have learned a lot from, from the software demonstration. Um, I, I see the use case. I see the beauty of that application. Um, is there anything else that you well, want to display or want to show? Or should we go back to the slides and, and do a quick recap? I think um, the basic steps, we have presented this. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of more things which we can do with controllers, but I think that's beyond the scope of this um, today's demonstration. So we can go back to the slides, I think. Okay, great. Frank, thanks a lot. Um, this brings us directly to the key takeaways. I think at that point, you have um, the pleasure and honor to go through the key takeaways, um, check whether they are right. And maybe we have a short discussion on topics that are not clear or very clear. Just um, let's see what, what we've done. Yeah, I hope we can, could demonstrate how easy it is to integrate uh, Simulink and um, the micro auto box mm -hmm. and to use the Simulink controller design and connect it to IRO, IO, in this case, um, uh, via the CAN controller mm -hmm. and generate um, a real-time application for that. Um, we have seen that uh, Control Desk is able to visualize the data and also used to control and interact with the micro auto box. And um, yeah, further, we've seen that it is possible to use MATLAB for data processing, which is recorded on the uh, micro auto box with the US fly, uh, USB flight recorder. Mm -hmm. The special, special focus on this uh, uh, video is, uh, was on the CAN communication, um, which we demonstrate how to uh, set up and configure the communication only in this case to read or receive messages from a CAN bus and um, yeah, to extract some signals from these messages and yeah, put them on a flight recorder and visualize them. Great. Um, well, perfect. I think from my point of view, there's not so much to add. I, I was really surprised about how easy you can set up a simple model. Um, I learned a lot when it came, came to the interface to Simulink, my, Micro Out of Box Simulink. I learned a lot when it came to CAN communication. And what was really convincing for me is to see a model that an actual formal student team has developed using that approach. Well, it's a bit more complex. Well, you guys have to invest a bit more time in, in order to set up a full-fledged uh, model. Um, but I think the path to that is clear. And this is a pretty convincing message to me. I think now, Frank, we have to do something that we've already promised. We have to provide teams with some resources. Um, yeah. I've already started to talk about that a bit. So a related Racing Lounge episode is definitely the data acquisition and analysis one. There's another one that deals more with CAN communication and the vehicle networks toolbox, because, well, you can also access CAN networks directly from MATLAB um, by using a, a piece of hardware called um, CAN logger. Um, for example, a supported piece by Quasar or Vector. And last but not least, we have an episode that deals with the principles of control design. I put that here mainly for the sake of, we have just touched briefly the, the, the topic of control design. Um, in that episode, you will see what, what Simulink can do more um, when it comes to that point. Um, I think now, Frank, um, you've already shown a lot. We've already seen a, a link to, to your documentation, which is pretty good. Um, is there anything else that teams should know um, that teams should have a look at? Yeah, if they like um, and if they, if they have no experience with DSpace, they can have a look at our web page. You provided the links, for example, to the micro auto box and to the RTI CAN message block set. Here you will see some basic information um, on the web page. For more detailed information, you have to look um, in the documentation um, of our products. 
um, also for can open um, this is documented in a so-called solution mm -hmm. um, where you can find um, yeah um, some um, more information on on this topic great um, this this wraps it up perfectly so last question that I have is what if I were a former student team I'm pretty convinced that this is a cool approach um, what should I do yeah, if you're interested in knowing about uh, knowing a bit more about the DSpace product, you can write us a mail. Mm -hmm. um, I think the mail uh, address is available on the next slide. Mm -hmm. um, with a communication, you can write uh, uh, email to uh, info at dspace mm -hmm. de, and uh, yeah, maybe apply for micro auto box or um, ask for several information. Mm -hmm. Our sales uh, members um, uh, will provide this information to you and. Yeah discuss maybe more details with you that's that's great so is is that sales rep um, um michael Stukholz? yeah it's michael Stukholz. typically he is a, a responsible technical sales engineer mm -hmm. for the formula student racing uh, series um he has a lot of experience uh, dealing with the formula student mm -hmm. and a lot of knowledge about um, what hardware and software uh, might be useful for the teams that's perfect. So I've already uh, had contact with Mr. Stukholz. Um, very nice guy, um, very supportive, um, definitely the right guy to go to. Um, and this already brought us to the last slide. So if you have feedback on that episode, well, feel free to, to send us a mail, either info at dspace.de or our formula student at methworks.com email address. We also have the Facebook group. Um, already um, Michael Stukholz and Frank Schmidtmeier are parts of that Facebook group. Um, we have a recent um, new member, it's Pat Clark. So there are a lot of VIPs assembled now. Um, really happy to see your feedback there, to see you discussing with us. Um, happy to well, get in contact. Um, then if you want to see other episodes of the Racing Lounge, just follow that link, methworks.com slash racing lounge. And well, just um, last information for you, we have, so we means Methworks has a former student software offer. If you're interested in that, follow that link and get your software. And if you do use our software, we would be pretty happy if you put our logo onto your car uh, or your reports. Um, Frank, at that point, thanks very, very much. Was excellent. Really enjoyed to, to cooperate with you. And I think at the end, the episode is pretty, pretty important and pretty interesting for teams out there. Yeah, thank you, Christoph, for inviting us to demonstrate some DSpace products. Actually, it was really a pleasure. And this brings us definitely to the end of that episode. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you next time. Thank you, and bye-bye. Bye-bye.